I didn't prove this one sort of to say nice. Everything I said was correct, but I didn't show it in the nicest form. So, so today I'm going to repeat that and go on further a little bit more before I go to the directive movement. I wrote down, on the board, I wrote down two results that we will be using today. And we did this before. So the first one is about the eigenvalue comparison, which we have, we have been using all the time. And the one that we will be using today is this one, of course, just like we did yesterday. And we'll be using this one a few times, the last one. That is this one. Well, near, near one lambda is positive. Here, this is the, the application of this lemma. And uh, remember what we needed was to, to get a positive steady state was to, uh, to, to use up, upper lower solutions and in, constructed, in, construct, in constructing lower solutions we needed this eigenvalue problem to cook up the lower solution. The same strategy we'll be, we will be using again today for the directed movement. So I wrote them down. And the, the lock couple terra competition system with M different from constant. Here the M it, it is assumed to be non-negative. But it doesn't really matter much because here the M doesn't have to be positive. So and we would be using many will be using M minus C V or M minus V U. So, and so in comparisons, these in comparison arguments, we are not using n being positive, not much anyway. So, but we are assuming this is uh, a weak competition, so we always assume this one. All right. We have seen yesterday that if m is a constant, regardless of d1, d2, there is a coexistence steady state which is globally asymptotically stable. So at the statement here I wrote this wrong, sorry. Mm -hmm. Alright. The statement is the, is, is as follows. The solution. The semi-trivial solution say that B10 is globally asymptotically stable. That is to say, U wipes out leech. There's no coexistence anymore. This, this makes uh, Marx a uh, dramatic departure from the constant coefficient case. For some, E1, E2. And we will also tell you what the D1, D2s are today. We did that yesterday anyway. The, and the B star was given by in Fremont of integral of m over integral of theta b, where b is positive. Right? So let me first tell you what the b1, b2 should be. So repeat this one from yesterday. Well, you can put a b in b star b1. That's correct. Yeah, you're right. Thank you. B is large enough. B start to one. So already I thought I was prepared. <laughs> Sorry. So if B is large enough close to one, C is close to zero, then U wipes out Z. That's the statement. For some D1, we know this is not true. For both D1, D2 small, or both D1, D2 large, it's not true. Okay. So here is the, here is one, and I will plot this function. This function will look like this. This is the function. This is d, 
the horizontal axis is D. This is the, this is M over integral theta D. And we know this is always less than one. We proved that before. And the B star is the minimum. This is the B star. Now, B is bigger than B star, between B star and one. So this is my B. <coughs> then this gives us a range, intersects the curve, of course, at, le at least one interval. It's here and here. This is the lower bar, this is the upper bar. So my D1 will be somewhere here. What about D2? So here's D2. So I will draw the picture now D1, D2. So this is D1, this is D2. This is the diagonal D1, D1 equals D2. And I have D bar, the upper bar here. Right? This is the lower bar, this is the upper bar. And I have my D1 sits in the middle. Okay, this is my D1. What, what about D2? D2 is, we have seen this yesterday, we want D2 to be bigger than 1 over than the 1 n minus b theta b1. So if you plot the curve of this one, it'll look like something like this. And uh, b2 has to lie in this way. Okay. Of course, at this time, it is not clear this curve should lie above the diagonal. That is to say, inside this curve, inside this curve, above this graph, it's not clear at this time that D2 there, uh, or, or put it this way, D2 is always bigger than D1. But it is. We'll prove that too. So this is roughly the picture. We're going to take D1, D2, sitting in the middle here. And show this is the case. Notice that I'm not I'm being a little sloppy here. That is to say, the C star here, what we're going to show, only the C star we pick with the panel D1, D2. It's a little diffi It's not un at least the, the proof we're going to show you is not uniform in this way. All right. So we did. For each, that's right, for each B, for each B, B decides B lower bar, the upper bar. So if B is something close to bar, yes. B lower bar close to zero. Correct. B upper bar close to B. Correct. So that means that you have some lower, some curve. Yes. So when when your d when your d when your b goes to one, presumably this will converge to actually this will converge to the upper triangle, hopefully. However, your c star will go to zero. May go to zero. And when that happens, this is far from the slower diffuser must prevail. So the C star is not allowed to be bigger. Now, if you, since you were in my colloquium the other day, the, 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 word, the, the second, there were two results with U wipes out V. This was the first. This was the result I said yesterday due to Yuan Lo in 2006, published in JDE. The second result that I will not have time to do here is that for B in this range, for any C less than or equal to one, one included, such a, but B, sorry, take it back. For B close to one, C can be one or smaller, anything between zero and one. For B close to one, this will happen. 
If D2 is bigger than D1 plus epsilon, remember that was what it, that's a, that's a little more difficult to do, so I'm not going to do, do that here. But today I just want to show some flavor of how this is done. But this theorem I will prove more or less in details. And as I said yesterday, we, the outline of the proof is first that we're going to show beta d1 0 is locally stable. So d1, d2 in this range for c star smaller, for regardless of c, regardless of c. This part is independent. Local stability is independent of c. This is independent of c. As long as b is in this range, d1, d2 is. The second step we're going to show is that for c small, for c star, for c between c star and zero, the, the system has no coexistence. And then we're going to show zero beta d2 is unstable. Then the monotone flow theory applies. So that's the strategy we're going to do today. The monotone flow theory, somebody asked me for a reference. That's a very good question yesterday. There are monotone. Usually, this is credited to Mo Hirsch. But I believe uh, the, the easiest, that's a very abstract thing. The easiest for, for people with differential equations, the easiest reference is a book by Peter Hess. You know, let's see, the late 80s or early 90s, I don't quite remember exactly, but it's a book by Peter Hess published by Longman, you know, this red book, red cover series. That book has, uh, also has a proof, much easier to read, and much more concrete, because Hess has differential equation in mind, not just topological flow. So now let's start proving, proving this. We did this yesterday, but I will run through that rather quickly, and actually it's not so hard. So what we did yesterday was we linearize the system at theta d1 zero. So let me write it down. It's d1 of phi phi 1 plus m minus 2 theta d1 phi 1 minus c theta d1 phi 2 plus Lambda phi 1 equals 0. E2 Laplace and phi 2 plus n minus b theta d1 phi 2. Right? And the v, when we linearize that, that drops. And then plus lambda phi 2 equals 0. And I have Neumann bound. We need to show the lambda. So suppose lambda phi 1, phi 2 is an eigenpair. This is eigenvalue. This is eigenfunction. And I want to show lambda, or the real part of lambda, is bigger than zero. Actually, it has to be real, because there's a single equation. You will see. This is, in general, you apply Crane Rudman to systems, but here, well, you apply Crane Rudman to single equation. Because the second equation doesn't involve phi 1. Therefore, lambda is real. Okay. It doesn't matter anyway. So, what we did yesterday, we said, I want to show lambda is positive. So, first case is phi 2 is not identically 0. What happens? Phi 2 is not identically 0. 
I want to show lambda is positive, so I want to divide through by d2. Apply to lemma 1. Apply the lemma over there, which I didn't do yesterday, but I only said so at the end. I'm sorry about that. This is 1 over d2. If 1 over d2 is the lambda over there, right? Then I m minus b theta d1 by 2 plus lambda over d2 by 2 equals 0. Let's look at the integral here. The integral m minus b theta d2, sorry, d1. b theta d1 is negative. This is because b is bigger than b star. This is because B is bigger than B star. So we are in this frame. This is negative, so I want to apply the second part, the third one, to show B1. So from this one, what do I have? I have lambda over D2 is bigger than mu1 of what? Of lambda. What is lambda? And that's D2. And the potential M over there becomes the potential becomes this one, right? Over there. But since this integral is negative, this one is positive. If this is my lambda in the lemma, if D2 1 over d2 is what? It's less than lambda 1 of m. What is m here? m is the integral. So I will, I will erase it and write it again. More room. This is the case if this is my lambda over there, right? This is my 1 over d2 is less than lambda 1 of m minus b theta d1. Because I'm applying this part. So the lambda here is 1 over d2 there. And the m here is m minus the b theta d1 there. Right? So this is what I know. But this, is, this holds because d2 is bigger than 1 over lambda 1 E2 is bigger than 1 over lambda 1, m minus b theta 1. I have that. Therefore, this holds. D1 is positive, 1 over D2 is positive. So lambda over D2 is positive, so lambda is positive. Yesterday, I had those, all these lambdas, and D2, and so on. Sorry about that. Oh, the second part, 5, 2, is identically 0. This part proves the same as before. It takes a minute, so let me run through that to make sure it's OK. This is 0, then I just go to the first equation. This becomes 0. What do I have? I have d1 Laplace phi 1 plus n minus 2 theta d1 <coughs> phi 1 plus lambda phi 1 equals 0. So this tells me <coughs> lambda is bigger than mu1 m minus 2 theta d1, right? But this is bigger than or equal to. But this is bigger than mu1, n minus theta d1, because this is strictly smaller than this one. So by the comparison we did before, we have that. And this is zero, because theta d1 is a solution of d e Laplacian theta plus theta m minus theta d1 equals 0, right? Because 0 means the first eigenvalue is 0, means plus 0 times theta equals 0. And that's why mu1 is 0. So lambda is positive. Finished. So you see that in this proof, it's independent of c. 
regardless of what C is. Okay. So the next step uh, I need to show is that for C small, I have no coexistence. The third step, 0, theta, B2, is unstable. That's also easy, easy to do. Similar. The second step requires a little bit more work. So let's do that. Any questions for this, for the local stability? You see, once you have the local stability, it already says this is different from the constant coefficient case, from the homogeneous case. Because in the constant coefficient case, this semi-trivial solution was never locally stable, never. Because there's a, there's a, go, there, there's a coexistence, globally stable coexistence, steady state. Nothing can be locally sta stable. All right, so the second step is I want to show for C small. So maybe I will label them, this is one, this is two, three, four. This is one, now two. So this is proof by contradiction. Suppose it's false. I want to find a contradiction. If, if it is false, that means I have a CI goes to zero, and I have a UI and VI coexistence state, positive steady state. Positive solution of this problem, of this problem. I'll write it down. D1 Laplacian UI plus UI times M minus B, sorry, M minus UI minus CI VI equals zero, B2 Laplace in VI plus VI M minus B, UI minus VI equals zero. And then I have the boundary condition. This is always bounded because we have, this is logistic type, lot of appearance is always bounded. We can always pass to a subsequence to show the convergence by regularity theory. So if necessary, we select this subsequence. So without our laws of generality, we can assume this converges to U, let's say U, U tilde, V tilde. The U tilde, V tilde will satisfy the limit. So what is the limit? The limit is D1, Laplace U tilde plus U tilde times M minus U tilde minus C, V tilde equals zero. Sorry, there's no C anymore. C I goes to zero. And I have B2, Laplace and V tilde, plus V tilde, N minus B, U tilde minus V tilde equals zero. And the boundary condition. Right? We have that. There are two possibilities. One is UI. U tilde is zero. This now becomes a single equation, right? The equation for U tilde is a single equation. B coupled. I have two possibilities. One is U is identical to zero. The second one is U, U tilde is what? Theta B1. So this is the first possibility. If that's the case, what happens? I want to derive a contradiction. If this is the case, I go back to this equation. I say if I see by ui, what do I have? I have d1 Laplace ui over ui, because ui is positive. 
plus m minus ui minus c i vi. equals zero. Then I integrate by parts. This one we have done this many times. It's d1 integral gradient ui squared over ui squared. Second one is integral of n. Second one I just, I, just, I just won't write it down. It's just the second one, OK? This is going to be positive. Therefore, this is going to be negative. What does that mean? That means I have, this implies integral of m is less than integral of ui plus ci vi. In the limit, we I have an equality. equality. Now, I may have equality. But in the limit, this one goes to 0. This goes to integral. And ui goes to 0. So this goes to ui till a square. Well. Vi is bounded. Ci goes to zero. So this is also zero. But V in this theorem, V was assumed, I mean M was assumed to be non negative. Here M is anything. Here M is non negative. Right? Contradiction. So this case we are done. The second case. Ui equals theta D1. What happens when ui equals theta d1? Let's see. Sorry, sorry about that. this part because the ui equals zero part is fairly, uh, maybe I do linearized, maybe I can do it over here. So what happens when ui is be that they run out of tape. Sorry about that. Okay. If ui is theta d1, the second equation becomes what? The second equation becomes d2 Laplacian v tilde plus v tilde times m minus b theta d1 minus d tilde equals zero, right? This is now my potential function, right? So V tilde has two possibilities. One, I mean V tilde is either strictly positive or identically zero. Maximal principle says either strictly positive or negative or, or 
if it is if it is not identically zero, it is strictly positive. So if it is strictly positive, what do I have? This implies B two. So this implies. is that. So D2 is big. D2 is in this range. Right? D2 is in this range. Meaning there's no positive steady state. All solutions go to zero. So I have D2 is bigger than lambda 1 m minus b theta d1. This is my choice of d2. So this implies v tilde is identically zero. But there is no contradiction yet. This is from the theorem. Right? Integral of this one is negative, so we have integral of that one is negative, so we apply this part, and v2 is here, so we have that. So V is identically zero. V tilde is identically zero. So now we're going to, so we again go back to the, to the equation for VI. And we're going to set VI, we're going to normalize it. In some sense, we're going to rescale this thing or blow up this thing. VI divided by its soup norm. We call this one VI tilde. Maybe I used tilde already, so I use star. So this is vi star. We set vi star to be that. Take the second equation, and the second equation becomes v2, a function vi star plus vi star times n minus b ui minus vi equals zero. Right? I just divide through by VI by VI, the soup norm of VI. Alright. Now I let now I let I go to infinity. And this goes to V2 a function V Again, pass into a subsequence because everything is bounded. Plus v e star times n minus v e theta v e one. U e equals to zero. Drops out. Normal boundary condition. Okay. Now here is a contradiction. The contradiction is the same, almost the same as before. So this means, this means what? Because V i star is that. So V star, so V i star has its suit norm one. Right. Therefore, V star cannot be zero. V star has sub norm one. Therefore, the V star is a positive solution of this one, right? So this means this. So this implies V star is positive. Maximum principle. So this implies what? This implies V two. Look at this. One. I divide through. Uh, let's see.
I want to apply it because this is now this is now a linear equation. So this means this means what? This means uh, that's right. So this means what do I have? This means this means we are in what range? We are in this range. This is the one I'm going to use now. What do I have there? I have, I divide through by V2, right? So I have Laplacian V star plus 1 over V2 times M minus B theta V1 V star equals V1. So this is my lambda in that lemma. This is my M in that lemma. And I have mu1 equals 0, right? Therefore, what do I have? Lambda must be lambda 1m. So this means 1 over b2 equals lambda 1 of m minus b theta d1. That's a contradiction. The reason is, reason is d2, figure that. The conclusion is D2 is that contradiction. So this shows no positive coexistence, no positive steady state. So step two is done. See, my time is, I don't have that much time. So, but anyway, three is not hard. So I can do that quickly to complete this thing. So that, uh, okay. So I want to show V rows theta, theta V2 is unstable. Uh, let me erase this. Is it okay? Is it okay? All right, so let me maybe erase this. the last step, four, or three, I want to show zero theta d2 is unstable. So same thing, I linearized at zero theta d2. And the equation should be v1 Laplacian phi 1 plus V will say that D2. So it should be, this is M minus M minus theta D2. Oh, sorry, C theta D2, right? There was a C. Yes. Times phi 1 plus lambda phi 1 equals 0. And then I have D2, Laplacian phi 2 plus m minus 2 theta d2 by 2 and then I have minus b theta d2 by 1 plus lambda phi 2 equals 0. Neumann boundary condition. I want to show this is unstable, that means I want to produce a negative eigenvalue. So the negative eigenvalue is, is a candidate. That would be the first eigenvalue of the first equation, right? So I will set lambda to be mu1 of d of 
first equation. That's m minus c theta d2 d1. So this is what I This is what I need to do, right? I need to, so I want to show this is negative. So I want to do a comparison. This is smaller than E1, N minus C theta D2, D2. Because D2 is bigger than D1. We haven't done that yet, but let me just assume that's the case. And then we'll come back to that. So D2 is bigger than D1. Actually, that's very, fairly simple from here. Because this number is bigger than D1. But the point I, I want to say is, if I can prove this, that means I can prove anything above this one, above this curve. This is this holds. But since I only, I'm only interested in producing one pair, I can take D2 to be very large. So I don't need to worry about this. But this is true. This is true. The reason is the same as what we just did before. But anyway, so D2 is bigger than D1. So D2 is bigger than D1. If you want, make this assumption too. Make, make this assumption in there. So D2 is bigger than D1. So I have this one. But this one is, again, is less than V1 of M minus theta D2, D2. Because this is bigger than this one. C is smaller than 1, right? C is smaller than 1. So this is bigger than that. So mu 1 is less than that. And this is zero. Because D2 is a solution. This theta D2 is a solution. So I have lambda is negative. The next step is to show that I can solve the second equation. We did this a number of times, but maybe twice. But let's do that. So for, to solve the second equation, you move this term to the, to the right hand side. So I will just cross it off and say this b theta d2 by 1. By 1 is the first eigen, that eigen function from the first equation. So this is known. In homogeneous equation, I want to show this is invertible, an invertible op operator. But again, this is true because lambda now is this one. Lambda is le less than 0. Lambda is less than 0. So I need to look at this one. If this one has its first eigenvalue positive, we are done, right? So, so this is the operator, d2 Laplacian plus m minus 2 theta d2. This is the one. Of course, we plus a lambda, but the lambda is negative. OK. This one, the first eigenvalue, mu 1 of m minus 2 theta d2, D2 is so it's bigger than you want to show this is bigger than zero, but this is bigger than mu one m minus theta d2 d2. Because this is smaller than that. Mm -hmm. So the eigenvalue is bigger. And this is zero. So the first eigenvalue of this operator is positive. So you add a, num a negative number still invertible. Itself is invertible. At a negative time, it's more invertible, of course. So you can solve this one. And phi 1 is the first eigen, eigen function, non-zero. Therefore, we, we get an eigenvalue that is negative. And therefore, this is unstable. That's the end of the proof. All right, any questions? If not, I'm going to move on to the, I have 15 minutes, move on to the direct, directed movements. All right. No? No questions? Yes. Yeah. 
we are solving two systems, how do you know, how do you, you, you just solve the second equation? This one. This is a couple. So this is a couple system. Sure. Second eigenvalue is always bigger than the first eigenvalue. Well, No, no, just a minute. The second I so 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 here's the strategy. Here's the strategy. Any eigenvalue here I want to show is positive. Okay, I want to show any eigenvalue is positive. So I take an eigenvalue, lambda, which is bigger than which is, I want to show it's positive, right? So now I have an eigenvalue and an eigenfunction phi one phi two. If phi 2 is non-zero, then lambda is positive already. Why? Because if phi 2 is non-zero, this is all phi 2, it's only phi 2 appears in the second equation. So don't, don't look at that yet. Just look at this first. Okay. So phi 2 appears only in the second equation. So this is an equation. This is self-contained. doesn't rely upon anything else. I understand. So, if lambda is positive, I'm done. Right. If lambda is positive, okay. No, 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 no problem. No problem. Okay. It's a, it's a, it's a very, very good question, and uh, really belongs to uh, so I will draw a picture about what just what you just said. Yeah. So maybe here. Let's start with the single equation. Because as you can see, the, pop, the first step only depends on the population. It doesn't depend on the, the distribution of the, uh, of, of, the, of the population. As long as the population is bigger than m, the integral of m, this works. Okay. Now, what you said, I want to explain a little bit in that direction. here, you gain a little bit here. The point is the compensation is always bigger than the loss. Okay. So that fact enables us to prove this. Okay. Global question is a much more difficult thing to do. As I explained the other day to the question at the colloquium that uh, it depends on how well the population, the species, utilize the, the resources. So here's the deal. The reason, there's one thing I didn't do here, was that, uh, but by this time, I could leave that as an exercise because you have, have good, uh, a lot of experience. This is very simple. If B is bigger than B stop, but we did, we did this last time though. 
If phi is bigger than b, uh, less than b star, this implies theta d10 can never be state. It's always a state. We did this last time. So basically, what it means is that if the population is not large enough, you can never fill a sort, sort of say fully consume the resources, then you always leave room for the other species to survive. So the population is important too. If this is the case, then the total population in the competition, B theta 1, so this is B theta 1, B theta B1. This one, the integral is already negative. So in the, in the, so, so in the ideal situation, if this survives, it will consume all the, all the resources. Leaves no room for the other one. But that's not quite true, because here, no matter what theta b is, you always leave some room. But same thing with theta d2, 0 theta d with v. So the question is, which one leaves more for the other to survive? d1 less than d2. And as I said the other day, I cannot prove this. D1 less than D2 seems to indicate, seems to imply theta D1 matches M better than theta D2. Because at the end, if, 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 if D1 goes to zero, again take the extreme case, take D1 goes to zero, D2, D2 goes to infinity, and theta D1 goes to M. Theta D2 goes to M average. So theta D2 will go into this one. That will leave a lot of room for the for D1 to survive. While say that D1 will go into this one. Leaves little room for, for V to survive. So but that's a much much more subtle point, and as I said, I cannot prove it. So that part I cannot prove. But of course if you let D equal to zero, D1 goes to zero, D2 goes to infinity, it's clear. But the, the, the interesting thing is, of course, for the slower diffuser to prevail, is that as long as D1 is less than D2, it wipes out. Well, that's what's amazing, or what's surprising to me. Just a little bit of room, that's enough. No. D1 here is always oh, stay away from zero. The reason is the population. If D1 goes to zero, B, because we have a B here, B is less than 1. B times theta B1 will always make it go to zero. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any more questions? I have five minutes more. Okay, so let's do the, let's do the directed movement. Or maybe we should leave it all together for the future. All right, so I will erase this. I will do it over here, side by side. So I don't have much time, so I will just do, to, do a comparison here. to work on. Welcome to the area. You can bring your students and your group, your postdoc and everything. That would be good. Okay. Or anybody, of course. But, uh, so the directed movement. The difference is only in the first term. So we're going to write down the same thing. And we have ut. Maybe this is weak enough for people to see. So I will use a different one. This is ut equals divergence gradient b1 u minus alpha u gradient m plus u n minus u minus v equals zero. 
sorry, there's no zero anymore. This is parabolic. At star. And Vt, same. Because now this is the flux. We have to change the no flux boundary condition here to no flux boundary condition there. So the form will change, but the, 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 it's still the no flux boundary condition. So I have B nu, uh, B1, B nu. u minus alpha u b mu n equals zero equal b mu b on a bound. So this is the difference. And the idea is what happens for alpha large. If alpha is small, everything is the same as before. What happens when alpha is small? This means, basically this means, you have some intelligence, you can move up the gradient of the resources term. This means you will move to a better, or to, to, the, to, 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 the, to the location where m is bigger. So, So this, the result I had in mind that I wanted to do was the following. Of course, to get there, we need to go through uh, a, a, a sort of a lengthy process, but, but that's for the future, I guess. So the theorem I want to do is that for, for alpha large, Again, we have two. We always have two semi-trivial steady states. One is theta. Now, the theta is depends on V1, right? Also depends on alpha. Of course, it's not clear there's a solution yet. There's a steady state for the single equation yet. But I was going to do that here, but I don't have time. Two, zero, theta B2. This is the same as before. I have two semi-trivial steady states. For alpha large, both are in state. That is to say, no one can wipe out the other one. Not only that, even locally, you cannot do that. Moreover, Alpha large, there exists a stable coexistence, stable positive steady state, that, is, that means coexistence. Stable positive steady state, i.e., coexistence. So nothing wipes out the other. And we are still in the weak competition case. And uh, another interesting thing here is that now it's independent of D1, D2. This, you, see, you don't see D1, D2 appear in this statement here. This is, it doesn't matter what D1, D2 is. Any D1, D2. Alpha depends on alpha depends on v one, and uh, 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 of course depends on m and and, and those things. And uh, what I didn't say here is that again. The population of of this one is important, and now it appears that this one again I cannot prove. It appears that for alpha large, the 
population is going to be smaller than the total carrying capacity, as a matter of fact. Uh, if you assume M, the critical points of M, as measure zero, then one can actually show that theta d1 alpha actually goes to zero. As alpha goes to infinity. And for the coexistence steady state, if I denote them here, this is the coexistence steady state. U, V, U tilde, V tilde. For the coexistence steady state, U, of course, will go to zero. V tilde will go to integral theta d2. In other words, when alpha becomes very large, if this is the case, but this assumption is crucial to, for this to hold. In general, this is not true. So if you, under this assumption, uh, V behaves as if U does not exist. And this is a theorem. I want to give a reference, then I quit. This is, it actually, there's a, you just need to find one of their papers. They will refer to the rest of their papers. Steve Cantrell, Chris Costner, and Yenlo. I want to recommend actually more than 2009. Very nice paper. Because they changed the gradient term, the dynamics to n minus u. And as I said the other day, people can do this. But that would be very complicated. So as a first step, they did this. But they only did a single equation case. For the system, it's more interesting, but it's much harder. This means you take the crowding effect of u into consideration. In many ways, this is more reasonable. However, if you drop this condition, if you drop that, uh, I would think that's the first step. Because whether this assumption is realistic or not, that is to say, as Professor Young proposed that example, I think the example is perfectly reasonable, don't you? Again, depending on the scale. How do you scale the, the habitat? But I think there's a reason. So I think we ought to drop this. Thing. So uh, we, are, we are now looking at, if you drop this, then what happens? So that's also one direction I can go in. All right, I think I, I'm over almost five minutes. I apologize. Thank you very much for your attention.